Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak before you. I appreciate the invitation from the brethren here. And I'm glad to see that even though all of you had other things that you could have been doing on this Friday evening, that you chose to be here. And I'm all the more pleased to see that because I know that you're not here because of my towering reputation, that you're here because you wanted to hear the gospel. And if the Lord wills, that is exactly what you will hear. When I study the scripture, one of the things that jumps out at me is the way that scriptural authors will often just kind of casually throw out these profound thoughts that aren't actually even part of the main argument that they're making. That there's some spiritual gem that would be like the highlight of the career of some religious philosopher and yet, uh, by inspiration, this writer just leaves it there and then moves on to another point. One of the places where this is most apparent to me is in the passage that is our topic for this evening, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. In context there, Paul is talking about why it is that he wants to be at home with Christ and rather co continuing in the body. And in particular, right around there, he's talking about the confidence that he has that this is a useful thing to be doing. And then in verse 7, he says, we walk by faith, not by sight, and then moves right back on to talking about confidence. And yet, even though this is not the main part of Paul's argument in this passage, it is still a thought that we need to be building our lives around. Because after all, if the world around us is walking by sight and we are walking by faith, then that means that we are going to be behaving very differently indeed than the world does. So let's consider then for the next few minutes this important topic of walking by faith, not by sight. As we begin this study, I want to begin as I often begin, and that is by considering this attribute in the life of our Lord Jesus. And obviously, faith means something different when we're talking about Jesus than when we're talking about one another and the faith that we have. After all, Jesus had seen God. None of us have ever seen him. And yet, it is still evident from the scripture that there are several ways in which Jesus, during his ministry, walked by faith. This faith, I think, is first displayed when it comes to the gospel that Jesus proclaimed, God's gospel. And for evidence of this, turn with me to John chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. The scripture tells us, I did tell you, and you don't believe, Jesus answered them. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. What's fascinating about this to me is the way that Jesus here is dealing with opposition. In context, if we were to take the time to read through this chapter, we would see that as Jesus so often does, he is confronting here a group of Jews who do not believe in him. But Jesus, rather than saying, well, maybe there's something wrong with the message, rather than saying, well, maybe there's something wrong with me, what Jesus does instead is he puts the blame squarely where it belongs. He says, if you were of my sheep, you would hear my voice. The problem here is not with what I am saying, the problem is with you. He believed that what he was saying would reach those whom the Father wanted it to reach. Today then, when we find ourselves in a similar circumstance, it's often difficult for us to have that same reaction. I think it's often the case for Christians that they have a friend and they try to tell them about Jesus and it doesn't go well. And so they say, well, I must not be good at this evangelist stuff. And they never try again. They give up on the whole idea of trying to reach the lost. Or even more, 
We might have let some ideas from the society around us creep into our heads so that we think, well, maybe it is true that the gospel is outdated, that it doesn't have anything to offer for today. When we start thinking in either one of these ways, we need instead to consider the example of Jesus. Let's start first with the idea that the gospel is good, but maybe we're inadequate. The thing is that even though that's true, it doesn't matter. Because who of us, who of any Christian who has ever lived, is adequate to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? None of us can reach that level. I certainly can't. All of us are doing nothing more than carrying treasure in earthen vessels. And so our trust needs to not be in ourselves as the messenger, but in the glory of the message that we are proclaiming. And friends, that message is no less relevant today than it was 2,000 years ago. The, the timeless power of the gospel still has the ability to reach hearts. It still has the ability to change lives. Whenever we meet rejection, which, if we are trying to bring others to the Lord, we are going to meet rejection. That's inevitable. When we meet that rejection, we need to remember where the blame truly lies. Second, I think we see the faith of Jesus displayed in his trust in God's salvation. And this is revealed in many places, but let's look particularly at the story described in Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 27. The scripture tells us, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with them. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In order to understand this story, I think we need to understand something about what it meant for a person in the first century to be a tax collector. Even today, the, the tax man is not the most popular guy in town. And that is especially true at this time of year as we are inching ever closer to April 15th. But we acknowledge that even those who work for the IRS, at least they are out there collecting taxes for our country that at least in some way are going to benefit us. 2,000 years ago, that was not true. That when we see people like Levi and the other tax collectors that we meet in scripture, they're not collecting taxes for the Jews. They are collecting taxes for the hated Roman occupiers. And they're just sending all that money overseas where it will do the Jewish nation no good. And their goal is to squeeze as much as they can for the benefit of their Roman overlords and indeed to feather their own nests. And so as a result, when we're talking about tax collectors in scripture, we are talking about people who are hated and feared. No self-respecting Jew would have anything to do with a tax collector. And yet, here we have Jesus, the Holy One of God, who trots up to the tax booth, says to Levi, come follow me. And to the surprise, I'd imagine, of everybody but Jesus, that's exactly what Levi does on his way to eventually become the Apostle Matthew. And so it proves that even though Levi had this extremely lowly social status, even though he was regarded by his fellow countrymen as somebody who was beyond salvation, when he encountered the truth of Jesus, that proved to be anything but the case. This too, I think, is a lesson that we need to remember today. Because in our lives, we also often encounter people whom we are tempted to believe are beyond the reach of the gospel. 
It could be somebody who is just sunk deep in a life of sin. Maybe it's somebody who's in an unscriptural marriage that you know that they don't have a right to the husband or the wife that they have. It could even be if this is somebody with a criminal record. And we look at people like that, and we say, there's just no way that somebody with that kind of baggage could ever become a disciple of Jesus. And yet, friends, no matter how great the sin in somebody's life may be, no matter how extreme the baggage could be, it is nonetheless the case that the power of the grace of Jesus is even greater. There is absolutely no one who is walking this earth right now who is beyond the reach of the salvation that Jesus offers. Our responsibility, friends, as the saying goes, is not to be soil analysts. It's not to say, oh, I don't think that one will work out, or that one, or that one. Our responsibility is to sow the seed. And we will find, if we do, that a good and honest heart sometimes shows up in the strangest of places. In addition, as we consider Jesus' career, we see him display his faith in God's resurrection. Look at how the Hebrews writer depicts him in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. When we look at this text, I think we see very clearly the humanity of Jesus. During his time on earth, of course, he was not merely fully God. He was also fully man. And that meant that he had the same appetites and desires and fears that we do. Jesus did not enjoy the prospect of death on the cross any more than we would if we were in his situation. However, even though his fleshly self dreaded what he knew was before him, still the scripture tells us that he went willingly toward the cross, that he set his face toward Jerusalem. And rather than asking God to sort of release him from duty, what Jesus asked for was, when I die, as I know I must, then God raise me from the dead. And so it was that in his suffering, in his obedience, he learned something that he could have learned in no other way. And when he rose, he became for all of us the source of eternal salvation. This is important to us because... When we're considering the God who did all of these things, he is not merely a God who raises the dead. He is a God who even raises the dead. That if he could bring Jesus back from the dead, then how much more can he do in our lives when we're not even facing a problem that's that serious? And it is often the case, I think, that in our walk with God, we encounter suffering, we encounter hard times, and yet it doesn't seem like God is interested in doing anything about it. Uh, we pray, and if there is a yes in there, it is certainly not happening on our timetable. In times like that, friends, we must remember that as was true with Jesus, that God has a higher purpose in mind for our lives as well. His goal for us is not ensuring our short-term happiness. Instead, what he desires is for us to glorify him by going to heaven ourselves, by bringing as many other people as we can with us. And sometimes, what will fit us best for that work is suffering. There have been times in my life when I endured intense suffering and then understood it a year or two later because it allowed me to reach someone whom I could not otherwise have reached. So when we encounter those difficult times in our lives, friends,
let's remember to trust. Let's remember that we serve a God who can bring good even from death. And let's live accordingly. However, even as we see Jesus so clearly walking by faith and not by sight, we need to remember that there are places in our lives where faith will not lead. And the first of these places where walking by faith will not go is to worldliness. Consider the sad account that Paul gives us in Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 18. He reports, For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. What we see here, friends, is a truth that is all too familiar to us. Paul here is recalling to the minds of the Philippians Christians who once walked faithfully with him, but now have been lured away by the devil to the point where they are serving no greater God than their own bellies. Worldliness was a deadly temptation 2,000 years ago. It continues to be so today. And we must remember that worldliness is something that can take a number of different forms. When we think of worldliness, a lot of the time we just think of gross immorality. We think of somebody who's a drunk or maybe engaged in sexual sin. Those are worldly people. But we must remember, friends, that those around us who give their lives over to materialism, to the pursuit of status, those people are just as worldly as the others. And they, too, exert a pull on us so that we will become more and more worldly like them. This is a very real danger for every Christian. The way, then, that we guard against this is by constant vigilance over our own hearts and our own lives. And one of the best ways to measure whether Christ is increasing in us or the world is increasing in us is to compare our spiritual lives to what they were a year ago, maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Where were we then? Where are we now? Now, for instance, are we assembling more faithfully with other Christians than we used to? Are we spending more time, maybe, in Bible study and prayer? Are we more useful in the Lord's service? Do our lives shine more brightly with the, with the light of Christ than they did five or ten years ago? If we answer that question, yes, then all is well. But if not, then that is almost certainly a sign of the worldliness creeping into our lives, creeping into our hearts, and trying to put us in the same position as these Christians in Philippians 3.18. That's not where faith goes. Nor, too, does faith lead us to worry. Look at our Lord's testimony on the subject of worry in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 31. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. In the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us, So don't worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's interesting, friends, that when I consider this text, one of the things that I see 
is that it describes the dark side of worldliness. Think about it. If we are not worldly, if more than anything else we desire to seek and to find God, then it is certain that we will find him. Because God always rewards those who diligently seek him with what they want. If our lives are all about God and all about Jesus, then it is certain that we will succeed in what is most important to us. However, that is not true of people who are worldly. Think about it. We've all seen people whose lives have been consumed and ruined by the pursuit of pleasure. We've seen failed marriages. We've seen failed friendships. We've seen failed businesses. We've seen bankruptcies. And all these things tell us that no matter how hard somebody pursues some worldly goal, gaining that goal is completely uncertain. In fact, if our lives are built around those things, then deep in our hearts we know that our life is built around something uncertain, that we might strive after something for decades and not get it. And that, friends, is where worry comes from, because we worry that this bad thing that we fear is going to come upon us. And what's worse is that if we're living this life where God hasn't taken center stage anymore, where instead of God being the center of everything, we've kind of moved off God into, into a corner, then we can't do the first Peter 5 thing anymore. We can't cast all of our cares upon him because he's not there for those cares to be cast on. And so even though God would help us, well, the problem is that we put him where he's not making very de many demands on us, so we like that. But what we don't like is that he's not offering us his strength and his consolation anymore either. We are all alone if we are worldly, and we know it. So we worry. This tells us, though, that just as Jesus sets it forth in this passage, that the antidote to worry is seeking the kingdom first. Because when we make our lives about seeking the things above, then we know that we will lay hold of those things. And we also know that if God is truly the first priority in our lives, and we can't fool God, we can't pull the wool over his eyes and act like we, we are making him the first priority when really money or something else is, that doesn't work. But if God is truly the first priority in our lives, then he will know that and he will take care of us. So when we build our lives around God, we will have what is most important, and we can be certain that he will take care of us and all the other things too. We don't have to worry about it, because everything is in hands that are much stronger than our own. Third, the, the scripture tells us that faith is not going to lead us to apostasy. Look at the description of apostasy in Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. Paul says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, rather than Christ, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Now, if I were to open a dictionary this morning, I'm sure there are lots of different definitions of apostasy that the dictionary would open. But when you get right down to it, what I think apostasy is, is apostasy is what happens whenever you get to think that, that you're smarter than God is. And as soon as you fall prey to that delusion, that's when you are going to wander from the track. Sometimes, apostasy is driven by pride, that we think we've got it all figured out, and so we don't need to follow God's pattern in his word anymore. 
But I think it is actually much more common that just as there is a link between worldliness and worry, so too there is a link between worry and apostasy. Let me give you some examples. We're afraid that the gospel isn't being preached, that not, the word isn't getting spread out enough. And so what we need to do is a whole bunch of churches need to band together in some huge organization that will make sure that the gospel gets preached. We look around and we see that Christians aren't being as hospitable as they should, that they're not welcoming other Christians into their homes. And so we say the solution to the problem is we need to build a fellowship hall so that all Christians will feel welcome. Uh, we come to worship and we say, honestly, the singing stinks. And so we need to bring in the instruments so that it sounds better. And that's where the apostasy comes in. The reality, though, is that rather than placing our faith in our own wisdom, to solve all of these problems, to assuage all of our worries, we are far better off placing our faith in the wisdom of the Word. Because I guarantee you, the solution to every single problem that a Christian might have or a church might have, the solution to every one of them is contained within the covers of the Bible. And if it is not in there, then it is not actually a solution. And very often, uh, the solutions are there, but we don't like them because they demand things of individual Christians, and that's the real problem. If indeed it is true that the gospel is not being proclaimed as widely as it should, then that's on all of us. We need to get out there and start telling the lost about it. If it's true that hospitality is not being shown and Christians feel excluded by others, that's on us too. We need to open our hearts. If it's true that the singing is lousy, then that's on us once again. We need to sing out. We need to be sure that with our whole hearts, we are making a joyful noise before the Lord. And in this way, we solve the problems that are before us while still remaining true to the work. Finally this evening, I want us to consider where the walk of faith will lead us. If it doesn't lead us to those things, where does it go? The first of these things that I want to bring up is that faith will lead us to spiritual growth. Look with me at 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. The scripture says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, Knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I was studying this text, as I was putting this sermon together, it put me in mind that back during the ministry of Jesus, in the parables of Jesus, there were a couple of things that Jesus compared to a mustard seed. The first of these is the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and the second is that faith is like a mustard seed. And I think it's appropriate even for us to link those two parables together, because ultimately it is faith that causes the kingdom of God to grow in us that once we believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, then that conviction cannot help but produce a spiritual chain reaction in our lives. And in fact, in these verses, we see Peter describe just what that chain reaction looks like. That as we develop faith, faith will start to appear in the way that we behave. Faith will change our actions. Once we start wanting to live more and more for God, then we will turn to the scripture. We will learn more about what God wants us to do. As our knowledge increases, our self-control will also necessarily increase. Because from the word, we will learn how better to discipline our lives. 
as self, our self-control improves, that will make us more committed, more persevering as Christians. The more our endurance increases, the more our lives will turn toward God. This godliness will express itself in our love for our neighbor. And as we learn to love our brother whom we have not seen, or whom we have seen, we will learn to love the God whom we have not seen. And so in this way, our lives will be changed. Not just changed a little bit, but transformed. Because ultimately, the power of this chain reaction in the spirit should be equal to the power of the chain reaction in a nuclear reactor. This should be something that alters our lives with an explosive force. Here, too, I think we find another call to examine ourselves. We need to look at ourselves, at our spirits, at our lives, and we need to ask, am I being transformed? Is there a spiritual transformation that is evident in me? And if that's not the case, if we just live pretty much like the people of the world all around us, then I think that calls into question whether we genuinely have faith. Because if we just say, yes, I love God, God is the most important thing in my life, I want to go to heaven more than anything else, and we really believe that, then it cannot help but powerfully change us. Similarly, the walk of faith is going to lead us through suffering. Read with me what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 27. He says, Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. A very popular false doctrine in our day is the so-called prosperity gospel, the gospel of health and wealth, the idea that we should be Christians because following Jesus is a ticket to earthly happiness. Now, there are more problems with that than I could describe in a single sermon. But one of the most dramatic of those problems is that it is simply completely at odds with the experience of Christians in the first century. If you go through and count, and I did this, I might be off by one or two. If you go through and count in your concordance, you will see that the word suffering and its variants are applied to Christ and his followers about 66 times. If you add persecution and its variants to that, then that adds another 40 times. And from this, it becomes obvious that persecution and suffering are not some kind of sideshow in the New Testament. They are one of the main themes of the gospel. The idea of suffering is simply not something that we can extricate from following Jesus. And because this is so, we need to recognize that we are being called to do something that is very unworldly. This seems like nonsense to the world. The world is all about what feels good right now, what will make me happy. And it is self-evidently obvious to the world that suffering is bad because it feels bad. And yet, that's not the way that suffering for the sake of righteousness is presented in Scripture. Notice, here in verse 29 in Philippians 2, Paul says, It has been granted to you to suffer. 
This is a gift from God that you right now are suffering because you have done the right thing and it's kicked up all kinds of opposition. This seems utterly counterintuitive. What kind of a bizarro gift from God is it to suffer? And yet, when we think about it, when we, especially when we consider Jesus, the connection becomes obvious. Jesus never did anything but what was right, and yet he suffered. Indeed, it is fair to say that he suffered because he did what was right. And no matter what time or place Jesus might have come in, I believe that it would have gotten exactly the same reception from the world. He was always something that the wicked could not stand. That means that, that if we are truly walking in his footsteps, then we can expect to meet exactly the same hostile reaction from the world. It could be that this suffering arises because Christ has called us to do something that is difficult, and the doing of it is hard, and we suffer. Jesus himself suffered for that reason on the cross if nowhere else. It could be that our suffering comes up because we are very open about our faith and we are surrounded by people who don't like hearing about it and they push back. Jesus suffered for that reason too. That's not what should concern us. What should concern us is if we are claiming to live a life that is following in the footsteps of Jesus and yet our life is going on without suffering. Because if we are just sailing right along without a care or problem in the world, I think at that point it becomes very important for us to ask what destination we are sailing toward. Finally this evening, I want to talk about how the walk of faith will lead us to Christ. Here, read with me from Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. The Hebrews writer says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The way that we come at this passage, it reminds me of what the psalmist says in Psalm 37, that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he will give us the desires of our heart. I don't think this is talking about a bait and switch. I don't think the point in Psalm 37 is that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he'll give us the million dollars that we were really after all along. God's a little bit smarter than that. He'll see through that. Instead, the point is that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he will give us our heart's desire because he is our heart's desire. And so, too, it is that the great prize for being a Christian is nothing other than Christ. Amen. There are a couple of different senses in which this is true. I think it is true in the way that Christ begins to grow within us. That as we begin to walk with him by faith, we find day by day, that we change to be more like him. That the sins that we used to struggle with are being laid by the wayside. That more and more, our, our nature and our character are like the nature and character of Jesus. And we see these changes in us, and we welcome them. So we find Christ within ourselves. But I think also, at the end of our walk of faith, we find Christ outside of ourselves. There are many ways that the scripture describes heaven. 
But I think that for me, my favorite, the one that will always be the most powerful, is at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, where Paul says, and so we will always be with the Lord. Amen. That's the very best one word definition of heaven is Jesus. That if you are with Jesus, then you are in heaven because where Jesus is, is heaven. This is a reward that makes absolutely no sense to the worldly. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why God didn't just say, okay, everybody gets to go to heaven. Because for most people, being around Jesus wouldn't be any kind of a reward. They haven't sought him with all their lives. They don't love him. They don't have an interest in him. And so they're stuck with somebody that they don't know and frankly don't like. That's not any good. But for those of us who have loved Jesus all our lives, who have set our hearts upon him, who rejoice at the thought of his appearing, then what greater reward could there be than being forever with our Lord? 